We're glad you decided to check out this message by Seabreeze Church and hope that you benefit from it. We also hope that you would join us either online or in person on a Sunday. We have a nine o'clock live stream service online, and then we have in-person services on our campus at nine and 1030. So again, we hope that you would join us and we hope that you enjoy this message. Well, hello, hello. Um, I'd like to welcome all of you here. Like Elliot said, uh, if we haven't met, my name is Andrew. I'm the student pastor here, and what that means is that I get to work primarily with the junior high and high school students, but this morning, I'm excited to be here with you today as we continue our Extraordinary series. So we are looking at how God uses ordinary people to make an extraordinary impact on the world around us. In this, we supply the ordinary, and God He supplies the extra so that we have an impact that we can never achieve on our own. And we've been looking at the two chapters, or the two letters that were written to the Corinthians. They've been our guide. Last week, Ethan, our family pastor, he he talked to us about the extraordinary life of influence that God has called each one of us to. So today, we're looking at the extraordinary endurance that we need to live that life of influence. So endurance is the capacity to hold out or bear up in the face of difficulty. And, you know, if we're being honest, most of us don't want extra endurance. We would would much prefer extra blessing, right? So if you had to add something to our lives, we'd much prefer blessing. But, I mean, don't get me wrong. Endurance is great to have if you are facing some type of difficulty, something hard is going on. but, But you only need endurance if something is difficult. We don't endure a Hawaiian vacation or a good book, right? I don't know if I've ever had to endure reading a book that I just kept turning the pages. But we endure hardship. I think as we look at our lives, if we're having to endure in some area, we often assume that that means that something's probably wrong. There seems, at least in my life, to always be an element, just an area where I have to personally endure something. It can be small or it can be a big area in my life. On any given day, I might be enduring through a morning quiet time where I'm reading uh, the Bible, and I'm just, you know, I'm not feeling it that day. Or I come home from work, and, you know, maybe the kids are misbehaving, and I feel the pressure of parenting. Or, I mean, maybe it's just something else in my life that just doesn't pan out the way that I thought. Uh, To the best of my ability, uh, you know, I'm trying to walk with God. I'm not perfect, but in those moments, uh, you know, sometimes I just ask the question, like, you know, am, am I doing something wrong here? If I'm having to endure, am I doing something wrong? And, and I'm willing to, to wager that you have asked yourself a similar question in your life. And one of our examples of the kind of endurance that is needed to walk with God is, is from the Apostle Paul. So he was an early church planter who really spent his life going from town to town telling people just the good news of forgiveness through Jesus Christ. And so we learned from Paul's life of extraordinary influence that he earned that influence as he endured through some extreme difficulties. Uh, he, he earned the, the right to influence people as he really went through some difficult things. So as I have read the New Testament, you know, I've noticed that Paul really knows a thing or two about endurance. So that's why we're looking at his life today. And, and as you read the pages of the New Testament, I think two things about Paul become very clear. He was an intense dude, and he went through a lot of tough stuff, even though he was doing the right thing. And in Paul's own words, I wanted to read to you a snapshot of some of the things that he personally endured. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 24 through 28, it says this. It says, Five times I received from the Jews the forty lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. I'm pretty sure city, country, and sea, that's everywhere, right? I have labored and toiled and have gone, often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst, and I have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. So as he's writing these things to the Corinthians, he's actually, before he ever even got to the church in Corinth, he's experienced a lot of these things. 
And you can find more about his time with the Corinthian church in Acts chapter 18. Paul spent about 18 months with them, teaching them and helping to grow the church, helping to start the church there. And in that chapter, after reading about the trials that Paul faced during his time with them, you would not doubt Paul's commitment and calling to help them grow their church. But after leaving the city of Corinth, some false teachers moved in. And in order to gain their own credibility, those false teachers began to bash the things that Paul had said. Um, And so, I mean, getting word of this, I mean, imagine with me what that must have been like. To a person entrusted by God to tell the truth to the Corinthian people, I mean, I don't think there's many more things that would be that disheartening. And no one likes to have what they said, you know, questioned or doubted. But can you imagine faithfully enduring the kind of opposition that we read about to get to a place to where you help a church grow, and then they would later bring your character and message into question? I I think, at least from my perspective, that would feel like an absolute failure. But rather than writing them off in anger or frustration, Paul decided to write them a letter. And in that letter, Paul wrote openly and honestly about his point of view. He even told them pretty plainly, the way that he ministered to them. And by writing that letter, we get an opportunity to be instructed by Paul in the life of endurance that we're called to. So today we're going to look at three perspectives that Paul had about endurance that allowed him to remain faithful to God over the long haul for his whole life. So the first is extraordinary endurance comes as we focus on the mercy of God and not our own results. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1 says, Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. So Paul here is talking about our, our ministry or our job from God. As Christ followers, it's, it's amazing. We get to personally know the God of the universe. We get to talk to him, be led by him, and then we get to have our lives transformed by his forgiveness and mercy from the inside out. And our job is to bring that message of forgiveness and transformation to other people. So we got this job not because we're the moral elite, but because of God's mercy in Christ that is changing us. Each one of us gets to carry out this job in the place that God has specifically put each one of us. You know, if you have a hobby, an activity, a friend group, if you go to a workplace, that, that's the place where God has, has put you in order to, to fulfill your job. And we know firsthand that Jesus can change us, and we really long to see other people changed as well. And so don't lose heart in this ministry. And that's, that's, it seems pretty abrupt at the end of this, this verse. He's talking about how the ministry we have comes by God's mercy, so don't lose heart. Now, why would the Bible say that? I think it's obvious because it's, it's really easy to do. This ministry we've been given is filled with failure. From our perspective, those we're praying for, and trying to help, they often don't show any signs of change. We lose heart quickly. Why? It's because we focus on the results. <laughs> you might be thinking, but Andrew, don't we want to see people's lives transformed? You know, like that's, you just said that's what we're here to do. Yes, of course we do. But as people, we're very optics-driven. We live practically by the equation, I do X and expect Y. That's the equation that we, we look for. We naturally look for the results of the effort of our hands that we can see, that we can track, that we can measure, or that we can control. If the positive results are increasing, a lot of us jokingly say, hey, I must be living right, you know? <laughs> but on the days when it seems like the results flatline or plummet, we begin to assume that something's going wrong. You know, if you work in manufacturing, that's logical, right? If you work in a factory and a plastic dog pops out and you make electric guitars, you should probably go check to see if something's wrong, right? Like, that's just not right. But when you take that I do X and expect Y mentality and apply it to the people God has put you in their life to to really help grow, you're gearing up for a world of disappointment. Before coming to Seabreeze, I worked as a stockbroker Uh, I really enjoyed getting to do that. Part of that job was really focused on results. And at times, that was discouraging. Honestly, uh, I worked on the phones. I was in a giant call center with a bunch of other people. We were helping clients, you know, navigate 
uh, the ins and outs of the, the stock market, and it, it was good, but, but actually my quarterly bonuses were completely dependent on my ability to get a perfect score on client surveys. And so, I mean, at times that could be discouraging, and I think everyone in the office felt the same tension. Uh, the, the temptation was to use a little bit of deception, you know, to make your clients feel good in that moment so that they might give you a good score, but in the long run, you were still telling a lie. So, but, you know, I knew what God had said, and so I decided not to do that. And while I could have padded my bank account in the short term, I really found that as I, I learned to, to really trust God and honor him in the way that I communicated with people and be a genuine help, that over the long haul, I found success. But on the days when the circumstances meant that I wasn't getting the scores that I, I thought I should be getting, it was really hard to keep my eyes off the results and keep from going down kind of the spiral of disappointment. So, because we do X and expect Y, that's why I struggle with that. You know, I didn't manipulate these clients for personal gain, so I expected good scores, right? That's the Y. X, I didn't manipulate Y, I get good scores. I prayed, therefore God should do it. I gave $100, therefore I should re receive at least $100. I prayed three times for that person so they made the right decision. So, so they, of course, will make the right decision, right? However, our equations don't always work. Our job from God deals with people, and people don't ni nicely fit into that I do X and expect Y computation. They have the freedom to make their own decisions before God, and they're doing what makes sense to them. And sadly, you know, what we think is best for their lives, or even what the Bible clearly says, that doesn't make sense to every person. And so if we're looking at the results, that can easily lead us to lose heart. So what reason does Paul give for why we shouldn't lose heart? I think that's what we really want to focus on. Okay, I don't want to, I don't want to do that. We only have this ministry by God's mercy. So as I was reading this passage, what, what I really... I think it's saying is, since our ministry comes from God, we are at his mercy. When you're at the mercy of someone, it means that you're completely in their power. And usually, we, we think of this as a bad thing. You know, if these are human agencies, we don't want to be at their mercies because they're, they're not perfect. But when it comes to God, this is exactly where we want to be. We want to be at his mercy. God is where the power comes from to fulfill his desires in our relationships. And he's the one that ultimately brings the, the results. And so he has promised what is ultimately good, and we can trust him as we really focus on that. And we, it's when we take our trust away from God and put it on getting the results of our work, that's, that's when we start to cut ourselves off from the power. It's like unplugging your laptop. It might not last very long. You might, might last long enough to get a few things done, but you're really giving up its full capability. It wasn't designed to only get a grand total of eight hours work done in its lifetime. In the same, in the same way, we need to, to fix our trust on God because the job we've been given to do is bigger than what we could accomplish on our own. We need him to endure. And besides, changing someone from the inside out, it's not even in our job description. That is left in the much more capable hands of God. And he's given us this immense privilege of getting to partner with him to help those around him. The only reason why we get this privilege of this humbling ministry to other people is by the mercy of God. And so that's why we don't lose heart, because he's the power source. And the second perspective that Paul had was that extraordinary endurance comes as we commit to live God's way, not ours. 2 Corinthians 4, verses 1 and 2 says, Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. So I think this is really helpful. This is when Paul is openly discussing how he ministered to the Corinthian people. His main strategy, rather than losing heart at lousy results, he wanted to to focus on success God's way. So success, according to Paul, was about having a clear conscience before God by living God's way. Here's how he described it. 
Rather than focusing on how people are or are not changing, we focus our attention on doing life God's way. We start by renouncing secret and shameful ways. These are the hidden motives or the the shameful ways that we live in private. However, with God, there is no difference between our private and our public life. Everything is in God's view. They're the same to him. Others may not know your secrets or the strategies you use to get the things that you want, but God does. And so we seek to keep our private and our public life in line with God's ways. He, he doesn't want to partner with those who live double lives. Another thing Paul says is that we don't use deception. One thing I've noticed is that people lie because it's seen as the easiest way to get what they want. And often they view the truth as something that will really cost them from getting what they want. And in 2021, the truth is really seen as the hard way, and a lie is seen as the easy way. But in God's economy, it's different. The truth is always the right way, and a lie is the wrong way to get what we desire. And the the next thing that Paul says is that we don't distort the Word of God. Distorting God's Word has been around since the very beginning, People twist what God has clearly said to get what they want. Usually, something God says gets in the way of someone's desires, and so um, they, they find someone who will, will teach what they want to hear, or they'll look for a reason why the Bible doesn't apply to a certain area of their lives. And it's not that we often set out to defy God's ways. It's just in that moment, we care more about getting what we want than really committing to live the kind of life God wants. So God partners with those that are committed to living his way. And God isn't an ends justify the means kind of God, but he's also not on his heavenly throne, biting his nails, worried about the results or our ability to produce them. God is perfectly capable to get the results that he wants. What we need to do is we need to be willing to trust God no matter the consequences. That's our job, is to trust God and live his way, no matter the consequences. The rest is up to him. The results are are part of God's job. And when we do this, we commend ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Now, I want to focus in on a word here that we don't use too often. It's the word commend. I don't think this is an everyday word. In my experience, it's reserved for award ceremonies or awkward office parties, you know, like when someone's giving a speech. But it means to verify as good. When someone receives a commendation, they're being recognized for doing good. Now, one of our everyday words usually is is a counterpart to commend. It's recommend. And basically, when you recommend something, you are verifying something's goodness based on past experience. Whole industries are built on recommendation. You know, Yelp, Angie's List, or any website that reviews products. They make their living attesting to something's goodness based on experience. And the more we can see the quality of something personally, the more likely we are to recommend it. The more it's it's impacted us, we're much more likely to recommend it to someone else. So Paul's goal was to verify Christ's goodness in front of other people by the way that he lived. He wanted to give credibility to his message by how he taught it and by how he lived it. There is greater power in our message when our life backs it up. And so it's, it's not enough to fill out, you know, a reference for Jesus listing his past accomplishments for other people. People need to see his goodness show up in real lives. Now, in that previous job I described earlier, one of my coworkers encouraged me to, to lie on a form that I was going to turn in uh, so that I could add a feature to my personal account uh, that would help me in my job a little bit. And this is actually something that most people at the company had done, and it seemed pretty crazy to me to lie on an official form that I was turning into my employers, but everyone had done it. (laughs) So, you know, to tell the truth, I, in that moment, whenever, you know, it was, it was, it was really high school. There was lots of guys that were like, turn in the form, do it, you know, lie. I was like, this is weird. No, I'm not going to lie on this form. Like, what? And so I didn't do it, and Rightfully so, I didn't get the feature added to my account, and that was okay. But the reason why I didn't is because, you know, that coworker that was encouraging me to lie, 
I knew that it was in the possibility, in the realm of possibility, that God would give me an opportunity to share about how Jesus changed my life with him. And if I couldn't be trusted to tell the truth on an insignificant form, and how could he trust me to tell him the truth about something that would, that would call his whole life <laughs> to be surrendered to Jesus? And so I, I, I just I couldn't do it. We are living recommendations of Christ to other people. We can help others towards a relationship with God by living and speaking in such a way that commends Jesus. And the final perspective that Paul had about endurance is that extraordinary endurance comes as we live for eternity, not now. 2 Corinthians 4, verses 16 through 18, say, Therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. So endurance is holding out or bearing up in the midst of difficulty. So normally, if we're going to succeed in something, we really need to know why we're doing it. We need to have a good reason. We need to be able to answer the question, why am I doing this? It's an important question. And last year, my wife and I, we got into this show called Alone. If you haven't seen it, basically the premise is people are dropped off by themselves in the middle of nowhere, and the goal is if you stay out here the longest by yourself, you win big money. And they, like, document themselves with cameras. Super interesting. Um, One of the things that we noticed was that, you know, if people looked at the cash prize as a way to, like, maybe pay off their house or, you know, get some type of just short gain. Maybe they were wanting to also test themselves against the great outdoors. You know, those people, they didn't, they didn't last too long. Now, one guy only made it a few hours. Like, he got dropped off. He's like, I'm out, you know? It's like, okay, cool. Um, but the people that typically won, they had a better reason for staying out there. Typically, they viewed the the financial gain as as leaving a legacy for future generations. They wanted to be a help to the future. And they were the ones that typically excelled. Now for us, endurance holds out for the eternal glory that will make the struggle seem light and momentary. When we see God face to face and we get to see the impact that he had through our lives, it will all be worth it. And I can guarantee that in eternity, we will be exceedingly grateful that we chose to live for that time rather than the the temporary. So I I once saw a message where a pastor kind of described this with a rope, and I thought it was super helpful. So basically, this rope represents our lives from the beginning through eternity. Imagine that this rope went on forever. And this red part is the part where we get to live. And in this, in this part, there are some very real choices that we make that impact the rest of the rope. But the messages that we get all the time, whether it's from the news or influencers, say that, you know, this, this red part, this is it. This is all you get. And so you need to grab all the trinkets and all the, the status that you can get to make the struggle worth it. Because this, this white part, they say it doesn't exist. But we know that it does exist. This is the scene and the temporary part. Just this little bit in the scope of all eternity. And we get the opportunity in this red part to live for something that will impact eternity into the future. Not just ours, but other people's. So this, this white part is the unseen and it's the eternal. And we look back at our lives from the perspective of eternity. We will really see the impact of living for eternal things rather than just the temporary. You know, if Paul focused on the temporary results of his labors, what would he have seen? I mean, in his own words, let's look at him. (laughs) He, He listed them. I thought it would be pretty fun to make a list of his achievements from the temporary perspective. Okay, so first he was whipped five times. I mean, that's a lot, guys. Uh, beaten with rods, he was shipwrecked three times. I don't know how that happens. 
And apparently he was in danger a lot. I mean, he did, he did get to start several fledgling churches, and he wrote them some letters to encourage them. And if we were there with him, looking at these results, I mean, of all the toil, what would we say? What would our advice be to our friend Paul? Even though we couldn't find anything wrong with his life or maybe his character, we might have told him that he just wasn't living right. We might try to find an area of his life that needed to be adjusted and, and because it seemed that he had spent most of his time just enduring through, through hardship. But was he right? With almost 2,000 years to look back at the things that came from Paul's life, was he right? Were his troubles light and momentary compared to the eternal glory that, that was waiting for him? Well, just from what we can see, I mean, millions of people, possibly billions, have read his letters, have been influenced by those he influenced. I mean, thousands of churches have started from the churches that he got started. I mean, who knows the true eternal impact of the life of Paul? I'm excited to find out. Extraordinary endurance like Paul's comes as we focus on the mercy of God rather than focusing on the results of our own effort. It comes as we commit to living God's way rather than using underhanded and deceptive ways to force results. And endurance comes as we focus on the eternal impact of our lives rather than the temporary circumstances. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for just the immense privilege it is to, to know you and walk with you. God, you... You say that you are with us in the good and the bad times, that you never leave us or forsake us. And God, you have given us such an amazing job. You've allowed us to partner with you to see lives transformed around us. God, I pray that each one of us, we would look at our lives, and if we're asking that question, like, what's wrong? Maybe there is something in our lives where we're using deception or lies to get what we want. Maybe there are areas of our lives where we, we really need to, to surrender that to you and to ask you to help us change in that area. But if we're going through some difficulties, God, I pray that you give us the perspective that Paul had and that each of us this week would be able to apply something that we heard today. Praise in Jesus' name. Amen.